Uh, hello and uh, greetings from the Australian General Semantics Society. <coughs> it's great to be back home for the AKML 2019 lecture and symposium. Uh, yes, as you can see, we don't see Australia as the land down under. It's clearly the centre of the world. <laughs> so perhaps it's just a matter of perspective, one of the important uh, foundations of general semantics. Hmm. Uh, I was here in 2012 when we had some excitement when Hurricane Sandy came to New York, but my lovely wife Jean accepted Marty's assurances that it was not likely to happen again this year. <laughs> and I told her of the hospitality and kindness that I'd received here on the previous visit and how uh, Kathy Levinson gave me maps and directions to get around. So Jean came along to share my experience here. We've added some travels to uh, Washington and Philadelphia and uh, Niagara Falls and so forth, uh, uh, and, a, and a selection for the last 10 days of the Big Apple. So we're not the only Australians on the move. It's just so heartwarming to see our Prime Minister assisting your lovely president in his election campaign in Ohio. <laughs> Through this old debate about free speech and uh, hate speech and human rights, <coughs> I'm mindful of Alfred Korzybski's notion of time binding, which I believe underlies the whole framework of general semantics. H how much we say verbally or in the media, etc., will be considered by our grandchildren to be a valuable contribution to their world. How much of it, I wonder. What will we be proud of for them to build on and develop? We're having a uh, seminar in Sydney next month to consider this challenge in more detail. You're all invited. Uh, it'll be an opportunity to return some of the hospitality that we've received in New York. I know it's a bit of a distance to get there. Well, we have been subjected to many in and increasing impositions on our liberty which are mostly considered an acceptable uh, aspect of time binding in a civil society. But the question of are we free deserves more than an either or response. And this is where general semantics emphasizes the value of degree orientation. Most of us do not consider that it's an unreasonable imposition to be required to drive on the same side of the road, even if it's the wrong side. Uh, or to retain, re refrain from attacking other people, etc. It's often said that our freedom to swing our arms should extend as far as the other person's nose, and that seems clear enough. In Australia, we do not have to carry or indeed possess any form of identification, but for practical purposes, you do need a bank account for, to receive wages, etc., or a driver's licence to drive a car. So it, it's a creeping form of uh, restriction of, light, of uh, rights that we mostly accept. Uh, smokers have been eased out of aeroplanes, restaurants, office buildings, and now almost every covered space. It's probably the most successful social engineering project in our history. Quite a restriction on freedom for smokers but a significant health benefit for everyone, smokers or not. Is this the case of projecting the risk caused by a single smoker onto all smokers? Australians have recently struggled with the legalities of single-sex marriage under Commonwealth law, abortion, drug reform, uh, loss of the need to prove fault in divorce proceedings and voluntary assisted euthanasia. In all these cases, the trend has been towards liberalising personal freedoms. I note, for example, in the, in the 1950s, we have a, had a referendum on the proposal to outlaw the Communist Party uh, in, in that age of McCarthy uh, frenzy, and uh, the proposal was rejected. People said, best to have the commos uh, uh, promoting their stuff and we can see what they're doing and keep an eye on them. And, of course, that uh, hysteria has sort of passed. The word bugger, if you'll excuse the word, used to be quite obscene in, in our country. However, former Prime Minister Bob Hawke was heckled, heckled uh, by a pensioner when delivering a speech and retorted, 
shut up, you silly old bugger, to an, to an aged pensioner who was interjecting. The crowd loved it, and Bob's popularity in, at the polls increased significantly. So the B word became rather acceptable to the extent that it started appearing in television advertisements and all over the place. Yeah, so should we see the liberalisation of accepting rude language as an increase in personal freedoms? We general semanticists love to appear uh, to apply dating and indexing to understand that these things change uh, in time and in space. How some, however, some of us oldies might find that uh, difficult to accept. Of course, we general semanticists are outraged by clear statements of falsehood, and I won't mention anything about the current political uh, environment in my host country here. Uh, and fake news, or, or to suffer political emotional damage from the stress of careless or deliberate map-making distortion. But it's very difficult to claim damages at law on this account, unless there's a clear financial consequence. Simply publishing something that's factually false uh, is not enough. You have to prove damage or reputation or other financial consequence. So, I mean, this, these are nonsense, and yet people accept that it appears on the front page of the Woman's Star, the most popular magazine in Australia. <laughs> the USA Constitution, First Amendment, does not distinguish between types of speech. It says, Congress, I understand, Congress shall make no law respecting or establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peaceably to assemble and to perform the government, or to petition the government for a redress of grievances. I'm sure you all learned that at primary school. Professor Nadine last night said that the limit to free speech, which I support and which is supported by American law, is often paraphrased as the clear and present danger requirement. And she mentioned that a little bit last night. But who can say what to whom? That's a picture of our uh, former Prime Minister. Um, in Australia, the state laws have been harmonised under the Commonwealth Defamation Act of 2005. We no longer have separate laws for libel, which is written material, or slander, which is spoken. It's all just called defamation. Basically, nothing much has changed in recent times. It's a question of established rep reputational damage on the basis of falsehood. What's changed, of course, is the way that messages are communicated, which certainly now includes uh, email, online posts, books and published articles. These laws are frequently invoked, resulting in an imposition of substantial damages. But as far as I know, it's never come to criminal damages or criminal prosecution. Section 18C of the Reg Racial Discrimination Act, the Australian Federal Hate Speech Law, has tended to dominate public debate about free speech in the last few years. This has meant other important laws that restri restrict free speech in broad ways are uh, overlooked. There is no public interest disclosure exemption under this law. So even journalists reporting on activities that a government might be undertaking illegally or corruptly can still be prohibited. The new laws relating to the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, ASIO, effectively gag all public protest against or even reporting of the use of ASIO's new detention and interrogation powers. It's now a crime punishable by up to five years jail to publicly mention any operation involving ASIO's unprecedented powers, to detain or interrogate, interrogate people without charge, simply on the allegation that they may have information relating to terrorism. The very fact that someone has been detained cannot be talked about publicly for up to 28 days. No other information about the detention can be disclosed for two years. In effect, these measures outlaw political campaigns against arbitrary or illegal detentions. If somebody sees a person being hauled away by ASIO, 
or the federal police for questioning, they cannot disclose the fact to anyone, not even a family member, friend, civil liberties group, member of parliament or political party. If a detainee's family or associates somehow find out about the detention, they cannot publicly comment on it in any way. The penalty is imprisonment for up to five years. In a significant departure from established law, the Act effectively reverses the burden of proof, overturning a basic protection against police frame-up. If ASIO alleges a person has information or material, the onus on the individual is to prove otherwise. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, however, I'm taking a little risk today in revealing to you the, um, uh, the identity of one called Witness K, who has recently um, come out about that. And you can see his portrait here. In 2004, the very new, the, the very new notion, nation of East Timor was engaged in negotiations with Australia to divide up the $50 billion underwater oil and gas reserves called Greater Sunrise Field that lies between Australia and Timor. <laughs> the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, ASIS, which is like your CIA, agents had been instructed to bug officers of the East Timor government to reveal its negotiating tactics and the competing views of cabinet members. The ASIS operation remained secret and the treaty was signed. Australia's actions would have been buried in perpetuity had it not been for one ASIS operative <coughs> known only as Witness K. We cannot reveal his name, but I've tamed a photograph okay. which I can share with you here. <laughs> <laughs> The senior intelligence officer felt deeply uncomfortable about the operation. He obtained permission to talk to an approved lawyer called Bernard Kaleri. Kaleri obtained, helped, the East government, helped the East Timor government build a case against Australia at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Incidentally, which the United States is not a, uh, not a member of alleging that the bugging had been had rendered the treaty vo void. And uh, such things become a source of much levity in Australia, despite the seriousness of it. I don't know if you have a breakfast cereal called Special K, yeah. but that was invoked yeah. for this purpose, yes. Another great opportunity for cartoonists with a serious message. Witness K and Kaleri now face jail term for helping correct what they saw as a gross injustice. Last month, Witness K pleaded guilty to sharing classified ACES information, a breach of Section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act. Kaleri will fight on, this is the barrister, facing a partially secret trial in the ACT Supreme Court, the court where he has spent much of his life practising as a barrister. Right, now we get on to this. Uh, yes, and so there's been much dem demonstrations in Australia and in East Timor about that. Uh, so it's ongoing. So now the government has cancelled the visa of right-wing provocateur and founder of the Proud Boys group that you may be quite proud of as a product of this country, um, Gavin McInnes, ahead of his plan to tour Australia with the group The Deplorables. The explanation was, it's up to the Immigration Minister to explain who he lets into Australia and how his decisions meet community standards and expectations. The Immigration Minister could not grant a visa to anyone who intends to vilify a segment of the Australian community or sow dangerous seeds of disunity. Allowing McInnes into our country would have crossed red lines. This is what uh, Professor Nadine was talking about last night. And would have sent the message that it's open season on the Jewish community and that the vilifying and maligning Australian Jews is okay and normal. This is the Immigration Minister. He said, I have no doubt that his visit would have cultivated a disruptive atmosphere of incitement as well as attracting hardcore extremists. 
and this explosive combination would have resulted in rioting and street fights, etc. So that goes on. Uh, in similar vein, I note that the FBI lists the deplorable group as extremist, and immigration officials deemed Gavin McInnes had failed the character test based on an extreme views and a petition of 81,000 signatures. The Pride Boys lost their values, list their values as including being against political correctness, racial guilt and racism, while promoting free speech and gun rights. But they have been widely criticised as promoting violence against people who do not share their views. Uh, so that was a, uh, a case where we excluded a couple of minutes. OK, I'll, I'll be quick. Some of our alleged, alleged um, threats are homegrown, of course. Here's a professional rugby union player and devout Christian called Israel Falau. Quite a nice, sensitive, new, eyes, new age guy, as you can see. He made headlines when he first dismissed, when he was dismissed by Rugby Australia for posting homophobic tweets from his personal account. Uh, and we'll go straight on to this. Um, so he's uh, speaking from the pulpit here as a Christian preacher. Um, yes, Rugby Australia maintains that his sacking is in line with a high-level breach of professional players' code of conduct. So he's not breaking any law by speaking against drunks, homos, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists and adulterers. However, it was alleged that he was acting contrary to the uh, code of conduct of the rugby union. Yes, yeah, so this has highlighted the conflict between freedom of religion and freedom of speech in Australia and points to some systemic flaws in Australia's constitution to protect fundamental human rights, which are not protected in any general sense in the Constitution as they are for the USA. Uh, here we have uh, Afnan Badar, Sydney-based Muslim speaker from the Islamic group Hizb al-Tahir, was to give a speech titled, Honour Killings Are Morally Justified, at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas in 2014. However, the event sparked such an enraged response on social media and talkback radio that the event was cancelled. Uh, there's a lot we could say about that, of course. But he defended it by saying things like, what is different is that I'm a Muslim, and one willing to intellectually challenge secular liberal ideology and mainstream values, such as a value that honour killings are not acceptable. Thank you, yes. Uh, so that was a uh, nice example of um, why can't we go forward ah yes and that's the sort of response that he uh, attracted and then of course uh, very quickly we've got the case of uh, uh, I am um, Charlie you know about that and the very famous cartoon this was from one of our homegrown uh, cartoonists in the Canberra Times who said that, of course, the justification for the shooting is that the cartoonist drew first. And that was a nice uh, interpretation. We do have something we're rather proud of called the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, where we promote people to come out and say all sorts of outrageous things. And I don't have time for that. And here's a picture of what happens when the dangerous ideas are uh, uh, espoused. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've had all sorts of speakers at that festival, including people like Julian Assange, who I'm, I'm sure you've uh, got some views about, Philip Nietzsche, the advocate of assisted dying, Germaine Greer, etc. Et um, and the Pussy Riot people of Moscow, we've had them, and uh, the, the Occupy Wall Street people, and all sorts of people like that. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that's a bit. I recall Pablo Casals, uh, who won the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1963. After complaining at length about the troubles of the world, he paused to conclude with the observation, the situation is hopeless, we must take the next steps. Well, I don't consider that the situation is hopeless. 
Uh, we'll continue to enjoy each day's sunrise uh, on the object level as per the structural differential. Uh, to think globally, globally and act locally, we can inspire and influence our family and friends, create materials for future generations, write letters to newspapers, lobby policy makers, and work with our comrades internationally. Long live General Semantics. Thank <laughs> you.